Okay, here we go. So welcome everybody. Great to see so many of you here this evening. Uh, really, really happy to be back again this year, 2021, uh, with another webinar series uh, talking about practical ideas that you can use uh, in the classroom. Um, today we are talking about well-being and motivation. Um, and the links between yeah, the links between those and what we do in the classroom. Um, and I know I said I'm going to make it very classroom oriented, but actually today I want to focus on you um, more so than thinking about your students. Although everything that I'm doing with you today, I would encourage you to consider doing with your students as well. I do with mine. Um, and, and most of the things I'm going to show you are, are activities, ideas, discussions, topics that I have, you know, actively thought about myself for myself, um, but also uh, with the with my learners as well. And so um, the I'll give further information later on uh, about the uh, the next two webinars in this series. So there's today, then there's another one next week, same day, same time. And there's another one the week after, but that's on Thursday rather than on Tuesday. So well-being and motivation, let's think for a moment about how how we are, uh, how we have been. Um, the last year has obviously been unlike any year we've experienced before. And um, it's interesting to think about the different metaphors that were being used to describe the pandemic and the situation that we've been going through as, as teachers uh, or as trainers, as learners, and also just as, as people, as humans. Um, and, you know, we've got this expression in English, uh, we're all in the same boat. Um, and I heard a lot of people using that expression towards kind of March of last year when when countries started going into lockdown, when our worlds started being turned upside down, when our jobs and the way we do them started changing, changing massively. Um, and it was kind of interesting because, you know, I don't think we were all in the same boat. And it was interesting to hear how that metaphor actually changed over time as well and over a number of months to kind of thinking about, well, actually, we're not all in the same boat because, you know, some people have very different working environments at home uh, than others do. Some people have a lot of space uh, from which to learn, from which to teach, from which to work. Others have very limited to no space. Some people have quiet environments. Others don't. Some people love the idea of lockdown because uh, it enabled them to travel less and commute less. Other people were panicked by it and clinging on, uh, like like holding on to a life ring, uh, to just try and get through it. And you know, initially we thought, okay, it's going to be it's going to be a month, and then we'll all be back in the classroom. And then it's going to be two, and then it's going to be four, and then six, and now fifteen months later, we're kind of still in that situation. So, to help give me a little bit of an idea about you and your context, um. Could you could you write into the chat box? Um, are you are you a teacher? Because I realise that some people here might not be teachers. Uh, if you're not, uh, tell me in one word what word you'd use to describe what you do. Although I can see I can see many people are saying yes, they are. Okay, and. Are you currently, or have you in the past year, uh, had to teach online um, due to the circumstances, due to the global pandemic? Okay, so I imagine pretty much everyone is going to say yes. There's one, there's one or two no's in there as well. And so, yeah, it's interesting just started this year or yes, doing lots of online teaching and I love it. So again, people are going to respond to it in, in, in very different ways um, in terms of how how they get on, how they have been getting on and how they feel about just how our careers, our, our lives, our working lives have taken a massive switch. And so I've got a question for you, just thinking about thinking about 12 months ago, 14 months ago, 
how did you feel back then? I've got a, I've got a poll for you, so you don't need to answer it in the chat field, but I'm going to try and open this up. Uh, oops. If you bear with me just a second. So it is there. So I need to, I need to drag it in here, I think. Here we go. So you should be seeing a poll now. So I have a question for you. How were you feeling last year? Like, let's say this time last year-ish, after we'd realized lockdown was going to be more than a month or more than a month or two. And your answers are all anonymized, by the way, but it's just, it's, it's interesting to kind of get a bit of a feeling for how people were feeling. You should be able to see the results there now as well. They're constantly changing a little bit, but there's no clear cut response. So, you know, we can't assume that other people were feeling the same way as we were 12 months ago. Um, you know, and I can see in the, in the chat field, some people are saying I was stressed. Others are saying, well, I was just fine. In the beginning, I was stressed, but then I kind of maybe got used to it in some way. Like any kind of change in the beginning, it's something that might create a bit of a sense of panic in us. But once we kind of work out a way of at least coping with it, coping mechanisms, dealing with it. Um, so, so that's kind of how you felt 12 months ago. Um, thinking about, oops, thinking about what you know now and how much you have grown and how much you have learnt, how much you have become used to what you've had to become used to. Um, I have a new question now focusing on now. How are you feeling now? So maybe contrasting it with how you felt then and how you feel now. So I'm going to show you the results of that as well. So you can see it's a pretty, it, it paint, paints a pretty different picture, doesn't it? So, you know, that, that I guess ideally shows us, or at least the majority uh, of people are feeling maybe differently to how they felt last year. They may be feeling more positive about things, more comfortable, more confident. Um, but I think that the, the key thing to think about here is that how we feel, I think, is a crucial, important thing to think about because we are the ones that, that set the mood for the for the classroom you know we're the ones that set the tone we're the ones that influence others with with how we feel and with how we think if we if we are not feeling good about things it it can be possible but difficult to mask that um you know in front of a screen or for our students um and you know we can directly have an influence on others in terms of lifting the mood up or potentially bringing it down just because of the difficulties that we're facing uh, and the difficulties that we're experiencing. And, and stress was a word that someone used uh, a moment ago as well to just describe how they felt. And so maybe you feel that you have built or developed some level of resilience uh, between this time last year and, and now. And so, um, you know, or maybe, or maybe the opposite is true. Maybe you feel that you, you, You've suffered a productivity loss of some kind in your in your teaching or how you how you approach it, how you address it. But just interesting to think about how we how we interact with the world around us, how we deal with the world around us. And not only us, but also our students. It's, it's you know, it can be useful to talk about these things. Um, you can see in the slide here that one of the causes of stress can be depression and anxiety. Depression is generally a, a, a feeling of foreboding or or or. or you know, a feeling that we get when we when we look to the past and we don't feel good about where we are now compared to the things in the past. Anxiety, on the other hand, looks to the future and is a concern or a worry about what might possibly happen. So we are in the present at any given moment in time and we can feel potentially depression and also uh, anxiety about about what we're interacting with, about what we're experiencing, what we have experienced, what we might experience in future. Um, and that can make us feel insecure, make us feel overloaded. It can make us feel kind of not in control of things. And so at times like that, we're faced with, with some choices. Um, you know, and one of, the, one of the kind of the starting choices that we might have is, do I do something? Can I do something? Or 
not. And so if we don't do anything at all, it's less likely to improve whatever we are feeling. If we're feeling something, something negative, if we're not feeling well in ourselves, um, it's not going to help the situation. If we do something about how we perceive the situation, about, about maybe what's causing our stress or about our confidence levels, um, then we have the potential to improve how we feel about things. And so the reason all of this is really important is because it's going to have a direct effect on our motivation. Um, our motivation to teach, our motivation to do our, to do our jobs, to help our students and so on, if we ourselves aren't feeling good. But these are also topics you can talk about with your, with your students um, and how their motivation has changed over the last 12 months, how they feel about learning. Um, because you might find that learners that were very vocal and engaged and interactive in a classroom environment maybe took a back seat and became less involved and, and, and quieter and maybe less engaged and less motivated because of the switch to a virtual teaching environment. Uh, the opposite could also be true though. Maybe the less motivated students from a face-to-face -face environment became more motivated by a change of medium. Or, or a change of communication channels and styles. And so this is all really relevant to motivation in the classroom and actually just addressing this as a topic with your learners and, and thinking about kind of rather than letting the circumstances happen to me and that to affect my well-being and my motivation um, and my drive is to think more about, well, what action can I do? What can I what can I control in this environment? And maybe what can I, what can I learn from it? You know, if you think 15 months ago, many people might not have had experience teaching online. Um, and now that is something that many of you have learned how to do. Um, and so, you know, there are ways to potentially reframe situations that we might perceive as, as, as negative or as, as problems that are, causing us headaches um, in such a way that maybe we see we, we can see them as, as challenges to overcome as to identify well what's the learning opportunity for me here so this is about adapting what's what's known as a growth mindset so rather than thinking oh i can't do this i'll never be able to do it it's about reframing it you know using what's often known as the the power of yet um, so rather than thinking I can't do this or I'm no good at this, it's maybe like, well, I can't do this yet or I'm not good at it yet. And this power of yet is also something that we can uh, talk to our learners about as well, especially if they are feeling perhaps a bit down or a bit demotivated or a bit disengaged, um, is, to, is to not so much necessarily focus on the now, but focus on the yet, focus on, on the future that they can that they can interact with or that they can change or do something about. Um, very quick question to the to the group here. Can you hear me okay? I, I realize someone's potentially experiencing sound difficulties. I just want to check with everyone else. Mostly okay. Okay. Okay, so it looks like it's okay. So the people who do have difficulties, I know the session is being recorded. Um, so I'm assuming it's being recorded as OK, in which case maybe you can have a look back uh, and pick up on any bits that you might have missed. Um, but I'm trying to follow what's on the slides as best I can anyway. Um, so hopefully it's not um, yeah, diminishing your experience too much. Um, but yeah, so thinking thinking about kind of how can we how can we react to the world around us with 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 you know with ways which might boost our motivation or especially lift us if we are feeling a bit down how can we build and develop greater levels of resilience thinking about those two polls i did with you a moment ago the difference between last year and this year what was it that that made you actually yeah in the chat field what was it that made you give a higher score if you were one of the people that gave yourself a higher score on the on the, the now versus last year what, what was it that made the difference for you was it more confidence at something or maybe less anxiety about the situation 
or acceptance of the change or maybe things are beginning to get back to normal for you in some way or training so maybe you've had training in being able to teach online getting used to the tools that you were kind of forced to get used to basically they say necessity is the mother of all invention and so yeah what has happened has forced yeah many people to have to learn and adapt to new ways of doing things and experience you know if you've never done something before it is potentially something that can cause anxiety the more practice you get at that the more experience you get at it, the more you can celebrate the success that you're having the better it will make you feel about it um and so on and so thinking about about ways to to develop resilience it's about thinking about how we perceive events about how we process events in this case, I've mentioned it as negative events, but events are just events. We, we are the ones that assign value to events, whether they are positive events or negative events, and how we process them. And so this is why some people embraced the opportunity of teaching online as something positive, while others maybe perceived it as something negative and something to, to feel anxious about. But the, but the fact of having to switch to teach online, that was neither positive nor negative. That was just an event. That was just something that was happening. We are the ones that assign value to events. And so, so you know, how can, we, how can we kind of, yeah, adapt and build, build resilience? It's, it's about how we respond to situations of difficulty, how we respond to situations of challenge. Um, are ways that we can build our own resilience in that context. And so it's about not hiding from the thing that we're concerned about, but actually facing up to it and accepting it. This is something I need to deal with. This is a situation that I'm now in. The change is happening. So what elements of that change can I, can I influence? Can I do something about? What can I learn from this? Um, where can I grow from this? And who can help me? Because no one is on their own. No one is an island. Everyone, you know, there will be people who can help you, whether it's friends or colleagues or a teaching association or your publisher or someone like that. There will be ways to get help. So it's important to have a support network as well in situations where you're trying to overcome difficulty and challenge. And so one way to do that is, um, is to... Yeah, to think about how we see those external events. And so this is, um, this is a little model that I just want to show you, um, known as the circle of concern. And there's another part to it as well, which I'll tell you about in a moment. But basically, if we, this is from, uh, from Stephen Covey's book, uh, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Um, there's a reference at the bottom of the slide there. But basically, if you think about the things that are concerning you, um, the things that are making you feel anxious, making you feel worried, and you put them all into a big circle, Okay, and all of the things inside of this you call your circle of concern. And some of those things you are going to be able to do something about. And some of those things you're not going to be able to do anything about. So you might just have to accept the situation. Like you're not going to be able to do anything last year about the fact that maybe your school or your face-to-face -face teaching environment closed and you were forced out of that environment. So that's definitely something that was concerning, but also something you couldn't do anything about but then there within all of the things that are concerning you there's going to be a set of things that you can actually do something about a set of things that you can influence that you can you can change you can learn about you can adapt to and so the key to managing these things that are concerning you is to try to focus on the things that you can influence and do something about and focus less on the things that you cannot do anything about and for those things it's more about trying to accept the situation as it is and so if we accept the situation as it is then maybe it becomes less concerning for us maybe it's no longer part of the circle of concern it's out of there and so what we want to try and do is focus on the things that we can change or influence and make our circle of influence expand and get bigger get as big as we can make it be 
Now, it will never be totally the same size as our circle of concern, because there will always be things that are concerning us that we still can't do anything about. But the idea here in terms of building resilience and building a way to accept moving through change and things that are concerning us uh, is to focus on the things that we can change. And that's going to have a direct effect on our well-being and on our motivation. And so I know I haven't directly addressed well-being and motivation yet with words, but but everything that we're kind of talking about now are ways to build and boost both of those. And so, so basically what I'm trying to get at is that if we can improve the way we think about things, that will have a direct and ideally positive effect on the way we feel about those things. And depending on how we feel about those things, that will have a direct effect on our behavior and what we do, because we generally tend to act according to our feelings. And so if you can control your thinking, then it can enable you to also have a positive influence on your behavior and how you interact with others around you and with your with your role, with your job, and so on and so forth. So, so this kind of leads me on to thinking about about well-being. So, so kind of how does all of this relate to well-being? What is what is well-being? Who wants to who wants to give me a, a definition in the chat field, please? What's what's well-being? What would you say well-being is? Balance. Harmony. Body, soul and mind in harmony. Okay. So it's about, it's about feeling, feeling good. Um, there's, there's a range of different definitions, depending on, you know, if you, do, if you do an online search, you'll get a whole load of different definitions, but it's generally about how we feel um, and how that relates to how we function, both on a personal level and on a social level, and generally how we evaluate our lives as a whole. And so it's really, really important to think about our well-being and also our learner's well-being you know and i know i know very often it can be you know it can be easy to focus on the content of the lesson on the lesson plan and on what you want to teach that particular day but you know it's important to think about your learner's well-being in itself as well um, if your learners are coming into your learning environment with poor levels of well-being uh, then that that is going to have a negative effect on their motivation and on their learning success in that lesson or in that course. The opposite is also true. If you've got um, learners who are having a poor learning experience, um, then that is also going to have a an effect, a negative effect on their well-being. So from our point of view, we want to be thinking about, well, what can we do to support our learners' well-being, either in general in their lives or also when they're in our lessons? And what can we do to support their learning success? And what influence do we have? And what influence does our own well-being have on that situation in our lessons? You know, we've got to take care of ourselves before we can take care of others. It's a little bit like, um, you know, the airplane safety briefing always says, put your own mask on before putting someone else's mask on. And it's the same with well-being as well. And so that's why today I'm focusing on, on us, on our, on your, your well-being, how that relates to, or how resilience relates to it, or how your well-being relates to resilience and, and anxiety and concerns and how all of that will affect motivation as well. So, um, yeah, so what can, what can we do about well-being? What can we do to develop our own well-being so there's a nice a nice quote just gone into the chat field there as well well-being is an overarching concept to refer to the quality of life of people in society that's a nice one but thinking thinking about an individual level then what what 
what can teachers do about their well-being if we if we're working on the the understanding that we need to have positive well-being in order to help our learners and others have it too and that's going to have a direct effect on um people's learning outcomes identifying what your personal needs are yeah because everyone everyone will be driven by different things everyone will have different needs uh, and so the activities which support my well-being will be different from the activities which support your well-being yeah love what you do of course if you're if you're if you're doing activities which don't make you happy that's you know we all have stuff that doesn't make us happy that we still have to do anyway because we have obligations but ideally that's the lesser period of time that we're spending and the greater period of time is is stuff that actually gives us energy stuff that drives our passion okay ah very good setting achievable goals so i've got a i've got a picture here that you know it's one of these ones when you when you do an online search for well-being and what images do you find there's a nice image you know that's got um, a range of different things which can support positive well-being, like there's food there. I think the idea here is around eating healthy. There's people exercising there. Um, sleep is represented. Um, but something that isn't represented, which someone just wrote in the chat field as well, is about uh, goals. Setting, setting achievable goals. Celebrating success identifying the small successes that we have, uh, spending time with other people, um, doing what gives you energy, maybe trying to do less of what takes away from your energy. So thinking about our students then, what can you do in your lessons as, a, as, a, as, as an activity or as a lesson focus, what can you do in your lessons to help support and develop your students' well-being? Yeah, smile. Reward people with a smile. That's nice. Yeah, okay. We can we can set achievable goals as well. Look to positives. What other ideas do we have? What can we do in our lessons to help support our learners' well-being? Adapt the lesson if necessary. Yeah, I like I like that idea. That that preempts one of my ideas later on. Absolutely. Take them seriously. Yeah, take them, take their learning goals seriously, take their success level seriously. Um, but also, and very much related to what I'm speaking about, take how they feel seriously. Listen to them, truly listen to them. Make, make the learning experience enjoyable. Set, set lesson outcomes that are realistic and attainable but will make them feel like they have achieved something. So you've got to get the level of challenge right as well. Um, it's what Krashen refers to as the I plus one theory. I being where I am right now, plus one is just leveling up that challenge just a little notch. You know, if you make it too difficult, it's going to be demotivating. It's going to negatively affect well-being, and it's going to negatively affect successful outcomes. If you make it too easy, then uh, the challenge isn't there, and so that may affect motivation as well uh, in our learners. So there's a couple of ideas that I have here specifically related actually to the topic of well-being is actually make it a topic of discussion. Discuss happiness. What is happiness? What does happiness mean for you? Tell me about the times that you feel happy. Tell me about the times that you don't feel happy. Can you come up with a definition of happiness in small groups? So just the action of talking about this, on one hand, it's going to practice fluency. It's going to bring in, you know, vocabulary and language elements just by virtue of the fact that you're communicating, that they're communicating. Um, but also even just thinking about this is going to help people identify how they feel, um, the times at which they feel happy maybe to track how they feel over a week so that they can identify times of the week or times of the day which they feel happier and other times maybe which they feel less happy or maybe times which they feel stressed. Maybe identify, well, what's causing you stress? Is that something, is it something you can influence? Think about the circle of concern versus the circle of influence. Can, how can you address your stress or reframe it in ways in which there are maybe growth opportunities or not? Um, 
an example here that the last one is is um, track your track your device usage or your social media usage for some people it's a it's a lifeline and they really need it especially in the last 12 months for other people it's potentially a frustration and they feel like they're spending too much time on those things it doesn't really matter there's no right or wrong answer but just getting people thinking about how they feel can start this dialogue can start this conversation um Lots of praise, lots of celebration of success, as I can see in the chat field. Praise people's results, praise their attitudes, have a positive attitude, encourage them. Um, and, um, you know, if, you, if you're involved in teaching business English or, or, or you know, people in, in the world of work or adults, you can also kind of think about how their businesses, how their companies address well-being. How do their organizations address um, balance. We had balance before as well as an example. So, you know, one example here is maybe to find out what different companies in the areas are doing for employees' work-life balance, uh, for well-being. This could be done through looking at local media, newspapers, could be looking at uh, local job advertisements or things like that. Um, and maybe thinking of, well, which ideas can you introduce in your own workplace? You don't have to be a team leader or a boss to introduce any measures in the workplace, but anyone can do that. So you could also, you know, discuss this with your learners if you're if you're teaching, you know, adult learners who 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 have jobs. Um, so interesting. Just having a quick look at the questions. Okay, so there's different sites there that have lots of different good ideas as well. Um, but yes, do you know? Don't make anyone feel pressured to talk about their feelings because they might not feel comfortable doing so uh, in front of the whole class or in front of uh, you know in a virtual or in an online environment. Again, if you're teaching in that in that context, um, so you know only you will know uh, the depth to which you can go. But you know what makes you happy is a fairly neutral enough question because you know people don't have to get into a deep level of talking about their 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 identity with that question because they could have responses around the weather or ice cream uh, or other things like that um and so you know well-being both ours and our learners is is really really important um for life but also for learning and for the impact the positive well-being will have on learning, but also the impact that negative well-being will have on learning. So moving on from well-being and touching on something that one or two of you have alluded to in the comments already, is I want to think about mindfulness and how mindfulness can help and what mindfulness actually is. Um, so quick, quick poll for you. Uh, not, a, not, a, not, a, not one I'm going to pull onto the screen, but into the chat field, please. Um, what is mindfulness? Have a quick read of the two definitions. Is it A or is it B? Is it about the ability to multitask without being stressed, let's say? Or is it about being fully present and focused on where you are, what you're doing, not distracted, let's say? So. So while A is a really good skill to have as well, um, is can you, can you juggle many things without, without, getting, without getting stressed and being able to multitask? But mindfulness in itself is, is the focus on the present, the focus on the here and now, being fully where you are at that moment and what you're doing. Okay, and you might think, well, you know, how or why is this relevant? But probably in the last 12 months, um, especially if you've been teaching online, you've seen the risk of people becoming distracted or multitasking during a live online lesson or session um, through checking emails or surfing the internet or doing other things rather than being there in the moment and focused on what you're doing. But, but why is mindfulness useful for learning? How does mindfulness relate to, to well-being? And how does all this relate to motivation as well? Um, so thinking about mindfulness and, and how it can help, it can, it can help learners reduce attention problems. 
So it really is about focusing on, on the here and the now, like putting your phone away, turning off your distractions from your computer, closing down all your other windows uh, that you might have open if you're doing an online teaching environment. If it's a face-to-face -face teaching environment, it's about really focusing on the here and the now, not only in your activities, like not checking your phone and things like that, but also in your mind. It's about not necessarily letting your mind wander and think about what's for dinner or, oh, I still need to do my tax declaration or whatever it might be. Our minds are constantly whirring and training the ability to turn off that noise and focus on where we are and exactly what we're doing has great benefits. You know, even when we're not exercising mindfulness, it can help improve uh, attention. Uh, potential attention problems uh, and that will have a positive effect on our social skills and also on our overall well-being um, and so it can help us manage distractions it can also help us manage our emotions because if we if we are mindful of how we are feeling right now in this moment then we can be more mindful of of our emotions and how certain certain situations impact those emotions okay um, and so if we or and our learners are directly focused on where we are and what we're doing, it can also improve, you know, classroom interactions and also classroom management. I'm sure we've all been guilty in the middle of a lesson while our learners are doing an activity of thinking ourselves, oh yeah, what's for dinner and things like that. But, but no, if we can focus more on exactly what's happening in that moment, um, then we can have better outcomes for ourselves, lead to better well-being in ourselves, but also for our learners as well. Um, and so thinking about overall overall mental health as well um, and helping our learners to stay present, helping us to stay present. And so thinking about, well, how can I bring mindfulness into my lessons? And this links also closely with well-being, because some of the ideas that you wrote about earlier on, on how to improve our learners or how to help support our learners' well-being, are also potential ways that we can also develop and improve our own mindfulness abilities. Okay, so what I'm thinking about is focusing on the now, truly be there in that lesson, truly listen to our students and what they're saying, what they're concerned about, and not thinking about the next stage of our lesson plan, or not thinking about where we want to guide the conversation, or you know, them to use a particular vocabulary form or a piece of grammar or a functional expression or something like that, but truly being there in the moment and listening to them and then being willing and able to not stick to our lesson plan, but to adapt to the needs of the learners in that moment and the interests and the direction that the lesson goes in. And it's not about not having a syllabus and it's not about not having a plan. It's about being in that moment and teaching the group rather than just teaching the plan um, and maybe worrying less about following the plan or worrying less about what our learners might think about us or our approaches and things like that and really you know being aware of our reactions this brings me back to what I was saying near the very beginning as well if we you know we influence others we influence our students just by our existence in front of them so if we are happy or we react in, in any way, maybe negatively or not, that's going to influence our learners, um, possibly not in positive ways. So for us to be aware of how we feel, what our own emotions are, what's driving them, and how that's, what our, what our thinking, how our thinking and our emotions are driving our behavior in our lessons, then that can help us be more aware of the the influence that we have on our learners as well. So these are all different ways that we can be aware of our own mindfulness in our lessons. And how can we help our, our learners develop their mindfulness in their lessons? Um, coming back to you know this, this linkage between happiness as well, is think about a place that makes them happy. Get them to describe it to you. You know, I mean, from a linguistic point of view, they'll be they'll be practicing lots of different vocabulary and language and forms and all of that. But but just to talk about somewhere somewhere that makes you feel good, somewhere that makes you feel happy. It might be your garden shed. It might be somewhere you went on holidays. It could be the beach. It could be the football field, whatever it is. Um, so on one hand, that's one way to do it. On another, on the other hand, tapping into your senses 
in terms of how you feel at that moment in the now is a really good way to turn off distractions from what you're going to do next, what you're going to do later, or maybe what's concerning or worrying you, and so on and so forth. Um, and so asking students to notice what's around them, listen to the sounds, describe what you can see out the window, um, or smells, basically activating the senses gets people, it turns off the noise in people's heads and it gets people focusing on the here and the now and on the moment. Uh, a taste exploration one is a really nice one for, um, I suppose you could, you, you could do this in the classroom, you know, bring in, bring in a, a, I don't know, a bowl of raisins, for example, or, or, or something else with a, maybe a distinctive texture of some kind, get people to taste it, close their eyes, explore the feeling of what it's like or the smell of something. You could do smell tests. Uh, you could get your learners to do this at home as well. If you give them a, maybe a list of three or four things in advance of the lesson to put in front of them and then do some blind testing. Um, the, the idea here is that it's getting them focused on the here and now. It's switching off the distractions in their mind. It's getting them thinking more about how they feel. And all of this is going to have a, have a positive effect on their overall well-being, but all of this is also going to help you understand them better. And the better you can understand them, the better you can adapt your own approaches to help address how they're feeling, bearing in mind that if they are feeling better, they're more likely to learn better and learn more than if not. Um, so there's a whole range of different ways that you can bring mindfulness into the classroom as well. Um, and so this all becomes relevant linking it back to motivation. And so mindfulness can improve our well-being. It can also improve our motivation. Motivation itself is such a huge psychological topic, uh, looking at you know, things like intrinsic and extrinsic motivation and, 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 and lots of different drivers. And so today I've been more focusing on the positive impact on motivation that we can get um, but also that our learners can get by thinking about well-being and the, the positive effects of that. So I realize uh, I've been speaking for quite a while. Um, like I said, all the different activities that I've kind of told you about today or the different things I've questioned with you, with the exception of the, the circle of concern and the circle of influence, have actually come from the materials that I have uh, written or the books that I've written uh, with, Con with Cornelson. Um, most of the ideas from today have been from um, B1, B2 or C1 levels, but a lot of the thinking that's been driving what I've been speaking about around lesson adaptation, around flexibility, um, and around just bringing topics like these into the classroom um, are all in these books as well. So even though, let's say they are business English books and I haven't been speaking per se about business English today, I think it's really important to acknowledge and be aware of the linkage between, between well-being and motivation and positive learning outcomes not only for our learners, but also for ourselves um, as teachers and trainers. And so if you do want to find out more about any of these books or any of the other books uh, that Cornelson um, has published, you can have a look at the website there. There is also a, uh, a YouTube channel, um, Cornelson Verlag uh, YouTube channel. There is a a business English playlist on that channel. So you can have a quick search for that. And there's about a dozen different videos with ready to go um, animated videos or interviews from these courses that you can also use in your learners. There's one in there on resilience. Uh, so the, the couple of screenshots and activities that I've used today are from that. There's also one in there around improving the way you think and the impact of that on what you feel and how you behave and do things. Um, so I hope you found this useful. Um, I hope you've gained some ideas, not only for yourself and your own well-being and your own motivation and how you've developed your own resilience over the last 12 months, how you felt 12 months ago, how you feel now. Um, and I would love to see you again next week. Um, I'm gonna be speaking about active learning. What active learning is, um, but how you can use it in your teaching and, you know, many of you uh, who, who, you know, maybe 
may have been more used to teaching face-to-face -face environments and thinking, yeah, okay, I know how to do that in a face-to-face -face situation. How do I do it in online learning? How can I create a student-led learning environment when everyone's online and virtual? So we're going to talk about that next week. And then the week after, we're going to look again at the topic of teaching online and just some different ideas and resources that you can bring in specifically for uh, online teaching. Um, uh, Uslem, my colleague, just mentioned um, earlier on the series that I did last year as well. Uh, they are also on the Cornelson uh, YouTube site. There were four kind of how-to webinars. Please go have a look at those if you're interested. Um, let me see. We've kind of come to a Q&A section of the session. We have a little bit more time now. Um, and if anyone has uh, would like to connect with me online, I share various things on social media um, around, around these topics, around teaching, around training, uh, coaching, things like that. There's some details there about how you can connect with me um, and follow me. The date is wrong in one of them. It is, because today's the 8th. Huh, very good. So um, next week, next week on Tuesday, Tuesday the 15th, I believe it is, um, is the one on active learning. Um, but I'm going to just jump on to the thank you slide. So thanks a lot for joining me today. I am going to stay on here for a moment, but we're just going to end the recording. Cornelsen. Potenziale entfalten.